This is Power Play. I'm Chris Steyerwalt. Thank you for being with us today uh, as we deal with a, with a somber topic, uh, but one that has managed to now finally start shaping the U.S. election, uh, and that's the ongoing uh, rebellion uh, in, in Syria. Helping us talk about that today. Ford O'Connell, you know him well. He is the chairman of Civic Forum PAC. He is a former presidential campaign advisor. He is a member of the Red Team, uh, and as always stipulated, he loves America. Uh, and please welcome to the dominant internet telecast of the 1130 half hour, Margie O'Mara. She is a Democratic pollster. Uh, she is the president of Momentum Analysis. Uh, and you can, by the way, I should point this out right now, you can follow him at Ford O'Connell, and you can follow her at Margie O'Mara. We like it when the guests have Twitter handles that match your names. Uh, okay, so uh, on, on to this serious business. Uh, so, uh, Margie, in this election, foreign policy has been sort of a, a non-entity. It flares up from time to time. But here in Syria, we have a situation that uh, Americans now are starting to pay a little bit more attention to because these atrocities are racking up and there doesn't seem to be a way out. Does this impinge on the presidential race in any way? It's just simply, ultimately, people, voters, are, and swing voters in particular, but a lot of voters generally, view the election through the eyes of, what does this mean for me? How is this going to help my daily circumstances? That's how most people view everything. Those are the only two eyes you have to to look out of. Depending on what happens in Syria because of the actors at play here, Russia, Iran, etc. And given the president's previous statement on greater flexibility with Russia, if things do go south, do like if, if things do go south in Syria and things flare up with Iran, it really could bring President Obama's leadership into question. But to be fair, to be fair, your guy uh, not does not have a thick foreign policy resume. He's got. I mean, well, I he think didn't, neither one has actually served in the military. So let's be honest. This, and we should. And, you know, I like to point this out. There are a lot. I know that a lot of you are veterans, um, and this will be the first time that we can guarantee that the winner of this election will not be a veteran since uh, 1944. Exactly. The the the, the post war American tradition is that every that in e in each election. At least one of the major party candidates has been a veteran, and this is the first time that that has not happened. Uh, so, uh, but Romney doesn't have a he doesn't have a portfolio on foreign policy, does he? No, he does not have a strong portfolio on foreign policy. But I think what he's saying right now really goes to the question of leadership. You know, can the president do more to sort of quell this situation? Is arming the rebels the right idea? Who we do not know much about. Should we have safe zones? Will Kofi Annan's plan and diplomacy actually work? You know, these are very real items because of who's at play here with Russia and Iran and what's going on with Israel as well. So th this could be something, you know, to look at as we move towards November. Right now, obviously, jobs in the economy are number one. But again, if things are going south there and the economy is not improving, President Obama's overall leadership does come into question. Well, I don't hear the measured tone that okay. Ford just used from the Romney campaign. I hear, uh, you know, very Manichaean. There's Obama's view and there's my view. My view's tough and right. Obama's view is feckless and irrational and, you know, paralysis and so on. Very, very strong words about what is actually a very strong uh, foreign policy record. And I, I think it's, you know, it just shows to me, it, it emphasizes how political and how thin uh, his, Romney's own foreign I, policy I, I views are. I think President Obama has actually, you know, trumped up his foreign policy as well, t touting around bin Laden sort of like a, a trophy. I mean, let, let's be honest here. Both sides are politicizing this. The question question is, is, depending on what flares up, President Obama's leadership could come into question. It's so funny to hear Republicans talk about you know, using the uh, bin Laden thing as a, as a trophy when you see, you know, we have former President Bush, uh, mission accomplished when, you know, the mission wasn't even accomplished at that point. I mean, you know, to think of what Republicans would have done with something similar. And this is coming, this is coming from, this is coming from President Obama who tied himself as an anti-war candidate, okay? And now he has a kill list and now he's using more drones than anybody else. Right, anything now. you guys have taken President Bush's policies and just ramp. We will up. stipulate. We will stipulate both of you that neither of you think that the candidate from the other side is doing a good job on this subject. Here's no. What, <laughs> so here's what uh, Charles Reese says: We are not the police of the world. We need our allies to help where and when they can. We cannot afford to get into another war when our economy is so weak. Yes, it's sad to see men, women, and children dying, but it's not the first time we have seen an evil regime kill their own people. Uh, well said, uh, Mr. Reese. Now. There is a point on this for Romney. There is a growing um, anti-war is the wrong thing. Uh, War iso weary. Isolationist <laughs> is even the wrong thing, but non-interventionist wing of the Republican Party that's growing. Uh, Ron Paul voters and others, this is a, a substantial wedge 
of the Republican Party. Is there a danger for it if, with Mitt Romney, as he sounds more and more hawkish on Syria and Iran and other issues, that it's a turnoff for these people uh, that that feel like Mr. Reese does? Yes and no. Okay. Yes, because I don't think anybody in America wants to see ground troops sent abroad after we've been in war for over 10 years now. That said, though, I do think that there's a lot of things out there that folks like Ron Paul would say are bad, which is things like sanctions, working better coalitions, right. you know, weapons, aid, et cetera. And I think that there's a fine line between the two. Now, what about this, uh, Margie? For the president, uh, Syria is uh, – so the Libya thing kind of worked out. Like it, the, we got we got by sort of by the skin of our teeth, uh, ended up killing uh, Gaddafi and got out of it. Looked for a minute like it might go very badly. And then we sort of we, we pulled it out at the end. Uh, Syria in an election year is just not from just to be crassly political. If you were if you were doing polling for the president, I assume that what you'd say is we're not interested in being in another. The, the electorate's not interested in being in another war right now, right? I certainly think that with Obama, ultimately, when he looks at these foreign policy issues, he's not thinking about uh, what what it means for a vote because ultimately, as we talked about in the beginning, foreign policy is not top of mind for swing voters. Period. And he's obviously spending time on foreign well, I, policy because that's the job of a president. And it's something he's been doing, you know, doing very well. At. I, I actually, I actually disagree. I think he's slightly looking at this politically because of the fact that it goes to leadership and because of the actors in play, given his statement about Russia and what's going on with Iran. These are two. The actors at play make this a very big issue, even though most people can't point out Syria on the map. And, and power play will stipulate that Vladimir Putin is super creepy. Okay. Uh, uh, so let's take this question uh, to Ford O'Connell and Maggie O'Mara, and we ask this. Uh, and let's start with you this time, Ford. Uh, what Jay Carney was saying there is that. It's different to be a profit-motivated person than it is to be somebody who is motivated by wanting people to get to work and caring about them, and that a person who gets laid off at Solyndra, as opposed to the old Kansas City Bolt that was featured in an anti-Romney ad from the president, uh, that the compassion for those people and interest in those people is what makes those things different. Yes and no. I, I think that this is going to be the issue that could very well decide who sits in the White House in 2013, because unless some unforeseen event comes about, this is all about jobs and the eco economy. Right. And it's really the idea of private equity versus public equity. And, uh, and Mitt Romney's right. He's saying that I've done a better job, you know, and I'm better at turning things around and being adept at cleaning up messes. Obviously, Solyndra was a, pri was a public equity situation where we put money in there, and it failed. Right. You know, and also, they're going to turn around and say at the same time, we, did, we, we made a profit in GM. See, what, what people don't realize is if you're not turning a profit, you're not adding jobs. And what it's showing here, frankly, is that the, this administration's lack of understanding about how the economy works. And if Romney can message this properly, he's going to win the election. Uh, Maggie, what yes. do you say? So, well, comparing Bain to Solyndra is like, uh, you know, it's comparing apples to flip-flops. Like, they're completely different things. Solyndra, there was, you know, it's a, there, first of all, there were a quarter million jobs added to the uh, clean energy sector, right? Uh, um, so, there has Using been taxpayer money. Right. Well, I mean, there's been 4.25 million new jobs under Obama administration. So in 26, job, in 26 yeah. straight months of private sector private sector job growth, and uh, Romney has one of the worst record, had one of the worst records in the country as governor for job creation. So, but his unemployment so, like, was lower okay, than because jobs. people stayed out of the job market, right? And it was still you know well low, you know much worse than the national average in terms of his records. Governor, that's why he doesn't talk about. It. That's why he talks about his experiences at Bain. Now. So that's the that's the background, right? Okay. You know, but that was uh, to, be, to be fair, though, that was a debacle, right? Solyndra was the White uh, House was memo said bad. that this was a blank show. I can't yes, use that, that word on the, on the internet. No, internet does not tolerate that <laughs> <laughs> that kind of talk. It was a debacle. Okay, so ten thousand pages, you find a curse. I'm saying no, no, but it, 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 it was not, a debacle. It was, not, it was not optimal. Can we can we agree okay. that it was not optimal? But there's been this talk that it somehow is indicative of some you know, some something rotten in the White House. It's just a complete falsehood. Now, by comparison, you have the Bain issue, which, you know, Mitt Romney himself uses as his main credential for being you know, being uh, being president. Meanwhile, but what he did was to create profits. His his job was not to create jobs, but to make money for himself and for his investors, and okay. which is fine. Do you know of a job? Or, or do you know of a business whose job is to create jobs? If you're not turning a profit, okay, you're not adding jobs. It's that simple. Whether you are running a lemonade stand on the corner or you're operating Staples, if you're not turning a profit, you're not adding jobs. I mean, that doesn't do anything to address. Well, first of all, it doesn't do anything to address the fact. Okay, let's take well, GM. Wait, no, wait a minute. Let, let, let the, okay. let the woman 
Right. I mean, you're talking about huge, huge increase in income inequality over the last few decades, where you have you know folks at the very top who are not necessarily creating jobs necessarily. They're not creating jobs that commensurate with their uh, you know. 20 million, 30 million dollar bonuses, golden parachutes, all these, you know, horrible things that we're hearing about, it, it, while the the 99 percent are getting less and less. And, you know, when you have Mitt Romney show time after time after time that he can't really get the average voter, he can't speak in the language of the average but voter. To, he but we're talking about jobs in the economy, not income inequality. And all the of point of sinking same. public the taxpayer funds into Solyndra was to help with energy and to create jobs. This failed and you lost billions of taxpayers' dollars. And we can go to something that you guys want to talk about, because when you guys tell GM, you say, GM is profitable again. Wow. Gee, we added jobs at GM. But you didn't actually add as many jobs as you lost. And frankly, you actually violated the tenets of free enterprise, because what you did is you put union contracts ahead of Class A debt holders. I so know I guess what, we I know what a joke bankrupt. GM was, because I was a All GM right bond now. holder. All right, now, this trolley is getting pretty far off the tracks. You, you, <laughs> you people are, are, are fired up today, and the Internet appreciates that. A lot of good uh, commentary here. Uh, Heather Snow, uh, Obama should have learned from Newt's failed attack on Bain. It's a losing issue. Voters are impressed with someone who knows how to make money instead of borrowing it uh, and or flat out losing it. And I think Newt Gingrich was always going to have a hard time getting the nomination. And the fact that his Bain attacks didn't work doesn't mean that it was the Bain, that the Bain attacks were the reason that he didn't become the nominee. I think the reason Newt didn't become the nominee predated all of that it was all, all happened well before he started well, that, attacking that really Romney. dates back to the 70s. Right. If you, want, mean, if you really want to get Newt into Gingrich it. Newt Gingrich has been right. unpopular nationally for oh, decades. Oh, well. But, but, but Newt Gingrich to, wasn't the only one who got hammered for these attacks. Well, there was a guy from Texas, where Rick Perry, who's now very, hurting uh, back home because of this. Ask, Again, ask it wasn't David the Bain attacks. It might have been the oops and the fact that he could have named three cap. You know, so that was bad, too. I think we can all stipulate that was not saying Bain alone was not the reason that those candidates. Okay, we have to go. And you know who we're going to give the last word to? We're going to give Greg Chang the last word and uh, with Solomonic wisdom as he says, profit one thing, maximizing impact of American taxpayer dollar another. Both important. Just like I said, Greg, there's there's good and bad in all of this for both campaigns and this is going to be uh, what in the technical terminology in politics is called a goat roping. And we're going to see a lot of goat roping between now uh, and and this fall. Uh, we hope you'll come back. Will uh, do. We'll, ha we'll have Ford be nicer to you next time. <laughs> Ford, we, we're always glad to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay.